There was a time in my life 20 years ago when I was driving a cab for a living. It was a cowboy's life, a gambler's life, a life for someone who wanted no boss, constant movement, and the thrill of a dice roll every time a passenger got into the cab. What I didn't count on when I took the job was that it was also a ministry. Because I drove the night shift, my cab became a rolling confessional. Passengers would climb in, sit behind me in total anonymity, and tell me of their lives. We were like strangers on a train, the passengers and I, hurtling through the night, revealing intimacies we would never have dreamt of sharing during the brighter light of the day. I encountered people whose lives amazed me, ennobled me, made me laugh, and made me weep. And none of those lives touched me more than that of a woman I picked up late on a warm August night. I was responding to a call from a small brick fourplex in a quiet part of town. I assumed I was being sent to pick up some partiers or someone who had just had a fight with a lover or someone going off to an early shift at some factory for the industrial part of town. When I arrived at the address, the building was dark except for a single light in the ground floor window. Under these circumstances, many drivers would just honk once or twice, wait a short minute, then drive away. Too many bad possibilities awaited a driver who went up to a darkened building at 2.30 in the morning. But I had seen too many people trapped in a life of poverty who depended on the cab as their only means of transportation. Unless the situation had a real whiff of danger, I always went to the door to find the passenger. It might, I reason, be someone who needs my assistance. Would I not want a driver to do the same if my mother or my father had called a cab? So I walked to the door and knocked. Just a minute, answered a frail and elderly voice. I could hear the sound of something being dragged across the floor. After a long pause, the door opened. A small woman, somewhere in her 80s, stood before me. She was wearing a print dress and a pillbox hat and a veil pinned on it, like you might see in a costume shop or a Goodwill store or in a 1940s movie. By her side was a small nylon suitcase. The sound had been dragging her, the sound had been her dragging it across the floor. The apartment looked as if no one had lived in it for years. All the furniture was covered with sheets. There were no clocks on the walls no knickknacks or utensils on the counters. In the corner was a cardboard box filled with photos and glassware. Would you carry my bag out to the car, she said. I'd like a few moments alone. Then you could come back and help me. I'm not very strong. I took the suitcase to the cab, then returned to assist the woman. She took my arm and we walked slowly toward the curb. She kept thanking me for my kindness. It's nothing, I told her. I just tried to treat my passengers the way I would want my mother treated. Oh, you're such a good boy, she said. Her praise and appreciation were almost embarrassing. When we got in the cab, she gave me an address. Then she said, could you drive through downtown? It's not the shortest way, I answered. Oh, I don't mind, she said. I'm, I'm in no hurry. I'm on my way to a hospice. I looked in the rearview mirror. Her eyes were glistening. I don't have any family left, she continued. The doctors say I should go there. He says I don't have very long. I quietly reached over and shut off the meter. What route would you like for me to go, I asked. And for the next two hours, we drove through the city. She showed me the building where she had once worked as an elevator operator. We drove through the neighborhood where she and her husband had lived when they had been first married. She had me pull up in front of a furniture warehouse that had once been a ballroom where she had gone dancing as a girl. Sometimes she would have me slow in front of a particular building or corner and would sit staring into the darkness saying nothing. As the first hint of sun was creasing the horizon, she suddenly said, I'm tired. 
Let's go now. We drove in silence to the address she had given me. It was a low building, like a small convalescent home with a driveway that passed under a portico. Two orderlies came out to the cab as soon as we pulled up. Without waiting for me, they opened the door and began assisting the woman. They were intent, watching her every move. They must have been expecting her. Perhaps she had phoned them right before we left. I opened the trunk and took the small suitcase up to the door. The woman was already seated in a wheelchair. How much do I owe you, she asked, reaching into her purse. Nothing, I said. Oh, you have to make a living, she answered. There are other passengers, I responded. Almost without thinking, I bent and gave her a hug. She held on to me tightly. You gave an old woman a little moment of joy, she said. Thank you. There was nothing more to say. I squeezed her hand once, then walked out into the dim morning light. Behind me, I could hear the door shut. It was the sound of the closing of a life. I did not pick up any more passengers that shift. I drove aimlessly, lost in thought. For the remainder of that day, I could hardly talk. What if that woman had gotten an angry driver or one who was impatient to end his shift? What if I had refused to take the run or had honked once and driven away? What if I had been in a foul mood and had refused to engage the woman in conversation? How many other moments like that had I missed or failed to grasp? We are so conditioned to think that our lives revolve around great moments. But great moments often catch us unaware. When that woman hugged me and said that I brought her a moment of joy, it was possible to believe that I had been placed on earth for the sole purpose of providing her with her last ride. I do not think I've ever done anything in my life that was any more important. If you like that video, you're going to love the next one. Click this thumbnail right here and I'll see you over there.